Hi, everybody. This is for Cyber in a Box School Video Challenge 2425 year. Our topic, challenge topic this year is securing Wyoming's critical energy infrastructure. And today we have Dr. Shea Wolf, Rita Foster, and Faith Coslett from the Idaho National Lab talking to us. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Rita, who's going to start the program. But thank you so much for being here with us today and giving us guidance on this topic. Thank you. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, thank you. Good, good. that's good. But yeah, that's that's the introduction. Uh, we all work for the Idaho National Lab, either as full-time employees or interns. Uh, we have a lot of mentorship. We do a lot of internships. And, um, and I work in National Homeland Security Division at the Idaho National Lab, and I work for infrastructure security, but I work across the boundaries because infrastructure is very, very complex. So with us, Shay, if you could introduce a little bit more about what you do, that'd be great. Sure, I work under um, a group called CyberCorp and um, we do a lot of cybersecurity research. I focus a lot on machine learning and um, AI and how we use that to do like reverse engineering at scale. And Faith, if you could just say a little bit about what you do here. Hi. Uh, most of the work I do on this team is after there's perhaps a historical sort of attack on an energy sector or some sort of critical infrastructure, I will do a lot of open source research and collect all of that data from a million different sources into one very shareable, uh, very thorough packet of information that can then be used in further things like AI or natural language processing. Thank you. Um, as we mentioned before, we are the lead lab for nuclear. That is our focus. We have a whole division that works on nuclear security. But in National Homeland Security, we get to work all across the different spectrums. Um, we do focus on all critical infrastructure, but my group really does focus on the power sector, um, the energy sector. And of course, this is Wyoming. So oil and natural gas, of course, rule there. Um, just some sources here and some pictures and cartoons. Um, done a little bit with uh, pipelines and transmission and, and distribution of oil and natural gas. It's a very interesting and very difficult uh, um, area to be able to control because there's so many moving parts. And I'm sure there are a lot of people and a lot of resources there that can discuss that. Um, people that you know probably work in this sector. And it's just, I encourage you to talk to the actual people that are working in the sector. You'll learn so much more, it's amazing. Um, but there's just a cartoon and some sources here to help you understand that. The internet is full of great sources of how these systems work. Again, oil and natural gas have that capability to store their energy in tanks, um, compressor station tanks, other things. Um, Unfortunately, um, the electric sector does not have that capability at the same degree. So it has different problems and different risk areas. Again, these maps are from the EIA. You have the links for those maps. Um, fascinating place to go through. A lot of graphical information systems that are changing the way we do things. They use graph. You're going to hear graph several times. Um, that is the technology that is pow powering all our AI and machine learning activities that we do including where geolocations are for these assets. Again, generation and oil and natural gas um, all over the United States. Uh, we are the number one producers of oil and natural gas, and that is a recent change. Uh, couldn't have said that 15 years ago. So it's been very fascinating to see that happen. But electricity is different. It's not stored. Um, there's a, It's very complex. There's a lot of different areas in that with the uh, the generation of it, a lot of different transformers that have to either take the voltage up or take the voltage down, depending on where you're going, to go through the transmission and the generation. And involving in all that place is instrumentation and control, control systems that touch that physical and cyber area. And you're going to hear that a couple of times because you're going to see examples of that. And the grid is mainly three separate grids. Texas is its own grid, ERCOT. The Western United States, where Wyoming and Idaho are, of course, uh, the largest of the grids, very rural, lots of transmission lines. As compared to the Eastern grid, 
a lot of different entities um, involved in that, a lot more entities than in the Western grid because of just the population and the number of generation transmission entities that are, and generation that are in there. So a lot of good sources on the NERC website, the National Electric Reliability Corporation, they regulate the electric grid. And the transmission lines, here's a very high level picture of that, but you're seeing some of the voltages there. You're seeing the dark green ones being more the DC interconnects, DC and AC of course are different as well. Um, a lot of great sources for that. And nuclear, here's the nuclear generation. Again, the EIA, the EIA website is amazing with their GIS capabilities. You can find all these things out with a couple of clicks. And renewable energy is growing. We're seeing a lot more of that. Wyoming is, Idaho is as well. So here's the solar and the wind. The solar is the yellow and the wind is the, wind is the darker gray. And then hydro is also on this map as well. These are considered the traditional non-carbon producing energy sources. So with that, we're gonna transition more into the cybersecurity of these systems and how we do that. Um, are there any other questions I guess we should go over on the, on the generation side of the house? I think it's really interesting. And I, when I was first looking at Wyoming, I was surprised at how many hydroelectric dams we have in, in Wyoming. I, I think it was seven, but I might be wrong. Um, and they're all over the place, but I know there's one in Cody that has offered, um, offered tours for students if, um, the teachers and the students would like to take a tour of that. Yeah, in Idaho Falls, where the Idaho National Lab headquarters is located, we have a lot, we have Idaho Falls Power, which controls a lot of hydro um, turbines as well on the Snake River. Um, and that's fascinating. I've taken several tours of that. I've worked with those people. It's, uh, it's amazing to see. And again, hydrogen is a stored energy source. The sun is not, the sun is either up or it's down. The wind is not stored. It's either blowing or not blowing. But these stored energy sources like the oil and gas, nuclear is not stored, but it's a chemical reaction that you have your, your um, sources there with you as well. A lot different risk profiles for those, right? Because you can do a lot more um, storage capabilities with those. So that's the things we think about when we think about the full risk and reliability of our electric sector including the cyber risk. Now you said that we're number one in oil and gas. Is that the U.S. I'm assuming? Yeah. Yes, okay. that is. Not, not yeah. necessarily Wyoming, but Wyoming pay, plays a big part of that. We, we pride ourselves in being the energy state, right? Because of our coal and, and uh, oil and gas. So, um, but we're really, we've got more than just oil and gas and coal. We've got a lot more going for us as well with that new, um, plant and Kemmerer that's nuclear as well as um, wind, solar, and hydroelectric. So it's and I, showed the, I showed the small modular reactor there the, from the Gates organization, the Terra Power for uh, Kemmerer. Forgot to mention that, but thank you. Yeah, that's that's really a neat project. And, and I hope that students and teachers get a chance to, to read about it a little bit more um, because uh, it sounds like it's going to be potentially the future of a lot of, of uh, the U.S. energy. Okay, I will let you move on. Thank you so much, Rita. <laughs> and uh, to forewarn uh, Shea and Faith, I'm only gonna talk about, I think, like, I think the next two or three slides after the Aurora demonstration. I'm done talking. So have fun with that. Look at those slides, please. What a um, but it's <laughs> so, so historically, you know, there's a lot of people, you'll see a lot of things in the news going, oh, this is the first time ever there's a cyber, a cyber issue with something. It's like, there's a lot of history here. Um, and so I put this thing together because it shows some of the older history. And just like Faith was saying earlier, how as soon as something happens, you have to go in and research and figure out what's true, what's not true. What can you take action on to protect the system? what you can't take action on. And that's something that um, Faith's been doing for us for, for um, pretty much her career um, as, as an upper upperclassman at the University of Wyoming. And we really appreciate that. 
But way back in the day in 2000, um, there was a release of sewage. It's another critical infrastructure, water, wastewater um, that happened in Australia. And it was a disgruntled employee, an insider who was let go. And they decided to make a mess at this big resort that they were working in. And that's how they, they uh, got their revenge by release, releasing sewage into a resort area in Australia, you know, pretty messy. But the one that I'm always fascinated with, I love to read about is way back in, in uh, June of 1982, there was the largest non-nuclear explosion ever recorded in space at the time. Um, this has a lot of uh, um, interest to me because it happened while, while I was still in college. Um, and it, an economics person named Guy Weiss um, is the one who is one of the masterminds of that. And you're seeing some articles here where um, William Sheffire um, wrote a nice operate uh, an opinion piece about him after he passed away. But what happened is that uh, during the Cold War at that time, uh, we worked with our friends up north and we understood what a, Siber a Siberian pipeline gas prom was going to do. So again, this is gas, oil and natural gas. And an inject was put into the system. It re resulted in a very large explosion. Um, this reads like a spy novel. If you ever go into the farewell dossier, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, but it was just, it's, it's fascinating. And it's like, our critical infrastructure is contested space. That's why we need people working in cybersecurity and resilience, um, including people with security clearances like Shea and I and Faith in the future, hopefully. Um, because you need to understand that there are people that are going to do bad. And the examples are all over the place with Ukraine. Um, back in 2005, I was asked to do, or six, I was asked to do a uh, demonstration um, to, to prove this cyber physical impact. And I did a demonstration in a diesel garage locally here, um, which resulted in being briefed up to different levels of government. And when it went to Secretary Chertoff of DHS, he said, I want it to be done on your test grid at the site. It's your real grid that's connected to the test grid. And I want it in two weeks. We did it in three. Um, and there's a video that was released from it. It says this is an official use only video. It was never, we treated it as official use only. It was never classified though. This is called the Aurora Generator Test. This was released by the Department of Homeland Security and CNN. This is a large generator that's synced up to our grid that's in, having these shocking torque impacts that occur. What's causing those torque impacts is a piece of code that's written about the size of a text message by one of our coworkers. And it jars the, the connections between the the engine and the generator so much it breaks the coupling inside. So in fact, I have a piece of it here. Let's see if I can find it. So, yeah. Here's a part of the rubber grommet that black is this stuff burning away. During that test. And it kind of shocked the community because it made them aware that there is a cyber physical issue. Wasn't shocking that this could happen. Things happen out of sync at the in the power grid and things get destroyed. That's not the shocking part. It was where and how easy it occurred. That's what was the shocking part. A lot of lessons learned from that. But from there, we'll talk about Russians in the grid, but it won't be me. But it won't be me. Yeah, so Russians in the grid is just a little bit before my time, I guess, before I came to INL, about the same year. But um, this is where we kind of like the first taste of STIG that I ever got working for INL. So STIG stands for Structured Threat Intelligence Graph. It was written by Jed Hale, who is an amazing researcher. Um, and essentially what we did was, um, so like when Faith says she takes a bunch of information from tons of different sources and compiles it into one very shareable um, packet of information. This is sort of the stuff she's talking about. So um, instead of just sending links on links and then expecting the other person to go through them all and get the exact same information that you got and then like organize it the same way, um, it organizes it into a very structured format so that um, 
it becomes a lot more actionable and used and useful. So um, what she's showing here, each of these little squares has code beneath it that essentially um, helps facilitate the transfer of that information from one group to another. So things like attack patterns, um, they're very structured so that you are talking the same language or understanding the same attack pattern on one side as the other, and it's all very cited and sourced. Um, and then to things like courses of action that can have scripts in them or um, indicators of compromise, which can um, have um, patterns in them so that you can easily identify um, things like Russians in the grid. So circling back around, um, this was back in 2018 where they were targeting critical infrastructure. Um, so mostly energy, but critical infrastructure isn't limited to energy. Um, but essentially by putting it into this um, sort of STIG format, um, you're able to add relationships between the different objects, add context, and that's what really beefs up um, our analysis of these different types of attacks. So here they're just grouped based off of um, different attack patterns and attack phases. So things like command and control versus like which tools did they use and of those tools, which ones were like PowerShell scripts. Did I miss anything, Rita? Yeah. Or no, what I did I miss, I guess is the question. <laughs> No, that, again, STIG is a graph database, graph structures, and we use those graph structures for embeddings in our AI and machine learning. Um, Faith has a lot of experience. She's done a lot of work with us on power inverters. Um, she has done, I'll let her explain what she's done with that and then talk a little bit about um, Showdown. Yeah, so I've ended up doing a lot of research on not only when an attack happens, do I maybe collect a lot of research on how did it happen? Who did it? Why were they motivated to do it? What did they exploit in the energy sector? But also we can do preventative work with this sort of uh, information. Uh, you can ahead of time before an attack ever happens, look at A, what, if we're talking about solar inverters, for example, um, what brands or products are popularly used in solar grids, uh, what components make up those solar inverters that are popular, and then what vulnerabilities do those components have. So ahead of time, I can maybe research one given product that is a very widely used solar panel or solar inverter and look at how is it built, what are every hardware and software piece that that's made of, and what are the possible weaknesses that someone could exploit in order to conduct an attack using that solar inverter? So by kind of collecting all that information in one space and sharing it using that sort of sticks graph thing we saw on the last slide, um, we're able to share that sort of protective information and make those inverters more resilient before an attack ever happens. Do you want to talk about what Shodan is? Because I know that a lot of students can actually get a free license for this. I don't know if Faith was going to talk about that, but Shodan is essentially um, a website that's, well, okay, I guess you would call it a search engine, right? But you're basically looking for interconnected devices on the internet. So... <laughs> Um, we have a lot of interns who have used Shodan extensively. Um, usually there are, are returning interns, um, but it collects data mostly from different things like web servers, um, common like protocols that you might have heard of before. I don't know how deep to get into it. Like <laughs> HTTP, HTTPS are the like main ones, but also things like FTP, SSH, Telnet. So one way that Shodan is actually important to uh, the power sector and protecting it is because you can search it for internet facing devices, that doesn't just include like computers, that also includes these inverters that are connected through various protocols to the internet. And usually you don't want them to be just freely connected to the internet where their information is public, anyone can access it. 
because then they might not be password protected and an attacker can just start using them or log into them and then the system that they're connected to. So by using Shodan, if you see an inverter that's connected to the internet and accessible through Shodan, then that means attackers can also actually discover those uh, inverters and use it to maybe conduct a solar attack. So it helps, it gives you an idea of how widely spread that sort of issue is and also helps you find that sort of vulnerability before someone else does. At one point in time, Casper, Wyoming, and this was way back, maybe 10 years ago, was the number two internet facing Wi-Fi routers in the entire US um, behind New York City that were not secured. They were the ones that were had the default admin ID and password. So just to bring that back home to Wyoming, I mean, all of our critical infrastructure has some sort of um, industrial control systems behind it. And some of them might be these inverters. And if you can see them on Shodan, that means anybody can, it's public, right? Okay, I'll let you, I'll let you move on. Yeah, that's very much so. So the public facing things are, are, are that's, that's just like a, a huge erroneous thing to do when you're trying to secure these systems, but it happens so easily with a misconfiguration or a reconfiguration. Next, we're going to talk about something that's a little bit hard to detect, a little bit hard to understand. And we all have a game to play in this. So Shay has done tons of research on something called UEFI. We'll have her explain some of that in a bit um, that relates to this. Um, Faith actually helped us do some of the analysis and verify some of the analysis we did on Volt Typhoon. It's in the news. It's been in the news for a while. Um, but what Volt Typhoon is, is working on individual libraries inside embedded systems that are mainly used in critical infrastructure. I'll put it th like that. And Faith and I work on uh, a Department of Home, a Department of Energy's um, Energy Threat Analysis Center, where we're able to do this type of analyses as well. But Shea, if you could start, and uh, Faith, if you could finish up on like some of the analysis that we were able to do with Full Typhoon. Sure. So, um, when Rita mentioned UEFI, that stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. At least it does on Mondays. So <laughs> um, things you might have heard um, similar to that are like BIOS. So it's the, um, but most devices use UEFI. So the problem is, is that you can have malware that directly targets UEFI so that it, um, it is already loaded before you get to different security checks that you would um, do as a part of like your operating system. So with that being said, that makes them really hard to detect um, and a lot um, harder to get rid of. So we call that like a rip and replace cost because usually if you have a device that has um, a problem with the UEFI, um, we're talking about having to like resolder a device or just rip it out and replace it all together. Um, so that increases the cost of different um, devices on um, like critical infrastructure, um, different targets like that. So we did a lot of analysis on different UEFI um, boot kits. We called them bad boots because they're bad boots <laughs> and they were made for walking. But the point being, um, we looked at those specifically because of the rip and replace costs associated with them, but also because it allows attackers to um, go in without a lot of like detection. Um, and then it also allows them to move laterally and um, kind of enter, well, enables a concept called like living off the land. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. So we were able to... No, go ahead. Go ahead. We were able to collect nine different versions of Volt Typhoon, even though it's mainly using what we would call malware tool sets, or we call them malware tool sets because they can be used for malicious reasons and they can be used for good reasons. Um, a system administrator may use it to verify some setting in their system. So they're used between both. Um, 
But Faith, if you could talk about once we get the malware, how do we process it? How do we analyze it? And then how do we convert it into something that's used and useful for the stakeholders in the energy sector? Yeah, so often malware will have uh, common indicators, maybe um, snippets of code that a lot of them reuse, or maybe one specific kind of malware like, well, Typhoon has a unique sort of technique that it used, or basically just a footprint that is indicative of that sort of malware or that specific one. Uh, what we can do when we get a sample of this malware is analyze it, deconstruct it, look for even bit patterns that are in the code itself. And once we have those sort of patterns that if you encounter them in your system, it'll possibly indicate to you, hey, you have this malware in your system, do something about it. Um, we can put that into automated processes that may be consistently, almost like an antivirus, but you can, you can run it on any of your grid devices. And that lets you sort of consistently scan for these attacks. So as soon as maybe it enc you encounter it in your system, as soon as someone does attack, you're able to notice that one pattern that tells you as soon as it happens. And then you're able to defend against it, uh, perform some countermeasures and get it out of your system. And of course, she does this all with using our STIG application and following the data standards, structured threat information expression. So we're speaking the same language. It's a very common language that can happen across different um, entities. And so that's why it's, it's um, relevant and very important. And it's useful and it's actionable and it's implementable. Shea, can you go a little bit more about when we have these mal this binary malware? What do we do with it? Sure. So um, I'll answer the opposite question first. What don't we do with it is compare hashes. So a lot of um, techniques and stuff that people use in industry today is to say, I have this malware, I took a hash of it, um, which means that um, it's like a fingerprint of this malware, but it's very static. Once you take that fingerprint, that's what it is. Um, if you go in and change one line of code, that um, changes the hash completely. So it's not a really good comparison. Um, what we do instead is use our machine learning techniques to go through each function and give each function its own, um, what we call an embedding. So think of it more of like a mathematical fingerprint that is based entirely off of um, what is each function doing? So not necessarily the characters and the keystrokes that it took to get there, but what is it, what is each function doing and what does it contribute to the malware? And then based off of that, each of those functions we can match against other functions and other malware to then determine more um, dynamically which malware is similar to which and in which ways, um, what functionality is the same. So that's what we're doing a lot with the different malware. So when they're saying, okay, we got, you know, 10 samples of old typhoon. I don't remember, was it nine, 10? Doesn't matter. My point is, when they get 10 samples of Volt Typhoon, we can look across those samples and see what's um, similar across each one. Maybe one of them's a little bit different. Maybe one of them um, was used against um, more of an energy system versus something like um, then going further to identify more of like a salt typhoon, which is more um, comms related. So that's what we're doing a lot with our machine learning is giving that finer grained, more dynamic look into the binaries instead of just comparing snapshots of binaries in time. Cool. What else about Volt Typhoon, Rita? Interface, man. I always have to find my interface. I'm always loaded between all these <laughs> different screens. I have no clue where I am at any point of any second, I swear. But yeah, Vault Typhoon was mainly the malware tool sets, like we said, and there was like, we identified five major malware tool set. We, five, we, the main one was the fast reverse proxy. It's a way to do command and control in and out of the system. Um, there was also something that was called a, a PDF 
power it has something to do with PDF documents, but um, there were some malicious um, drops that occurred or deliveries that occurred during the install of this. It was a big, huge piece of code because it was doing an install. Um, something called Earthworm, which you know kind of transfers laterally. Uh, remote admin, again, a tool that admins would love to use, but it can be used maliciously as well. And something else called Spyboy, which I don't remember what that one was. It was a while ago, it was last year. Yeah, but those were the malware tool sets that we were able to identify and the Volt Typhoon samples that we were able to retrieve. And it's an ongoing problem because it's just very hard to detect. And that's why Faith's work of trying to figure out these patterns, trying to figure out these similarities after all our analyses is so important. Faith, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? No, I think that sums it all up. Right. So we were able to talk about infrastructure, the different types of infrastructure that make up the energy grid, whether it's uh, oil and natural gas, go Wyoming, go USA, or whether it's uh, more the electric elect electricity side, which is everywhere and we rely on it and we're relying on it and depending on it even more with the use of electric vehicles and other electrification of things that we've never thought about electrifying before. Um, these are very complex systems. It is ripe for research. It is ripe for understanding. It is a great place to figure out a future career or a job because these complexities provide opportunities for our adversaries. And in our critical infrastructure is contested space. So I'll leave you with a bunch of resources um, in infrastructure, because that's where I am. I'm team infrastructure. Shea and sometimes Faith are more team cyber, but you know, we still work together. I'm sure you have to work hand, hand in hand, right, Rita? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for have for um for coming on today and allowing us to record and providing extra information. Is there anything else that um you'd like to talk about with in a, you know any current events, um encouragement for you know finding tours, anything like that that you'd like to to bring to our students and teachers? Oh, goodness. I would say, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so because I'm team cyber, I'll talk a little bit about that, I guess. But there are so many cyber tools. There are ones for the good guys. There's one for the bad guys. There's ones that aren't necessarily either or, right? That's just whatever you use them for. So just getting used to some of those different things, understanding like what they do, there's um, tons of value in that. Um, because as soon as you start understanding where those tools are, or maybe you understand and think better in like strategies, right? What those strategies are. Um, then when these different news articles come up that say Volt Typhoon targets energy infrastructure, um, you become a lot more uh, able to read those documents um, fluidly in a way that makes sense to you. So there's a lot of different like cyber challenges that can help you um, or introduce you to those types of tools um, or, um, you know, always, always good to get an internship. I mean, I think if they were awful, Faith wouldn't still be here, but <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Faith has been an intern for a while. She's one of our, our best, so. I, th I think you've been here longer. I have, I got, I did. You know who's here the longest is uh, is my husband. He's like maybe one of the longest serving interns of all time, but. So if, you know, when you, when Faith and Shea, when you both studied at the University of Wyoming, what did you start out in? Were you a computer computer science majors? Um, no. <laughs> so I grew up in Buffalo, Wyoming, and they did not have computer science when I was there. Um, those were the early years back in the day. But um, so I started in math, but I was pretty good at things like R and um, some different other like programming languages. So then that got me into computer science. But um, I wasn't really in love with it until I found uh, machine learning and like cybersecurity and how those two play well together. Um, then I got a lot more excited about it. So 
I've heard about students taking apart, you know, clock radio or and and putting it back together. I mean, is that really a good analogy for how things work and then trying to figure out how the code in that works also? Um, just to start oh, out with with something for, you know, industrial control systems. Yeah, sure. So I don't I think it just depends on how you learn. Um, I'm awful at taking things apart. Um, it stresses me out, <laughs> but uh, my husband is one of those people who can take apart anything and put it back together. And if it's not the same way it came apart, it's better than the way it came apart. So that would be like a great way he would learn. I know a lot of people go like just getting some of these stinky devices that are out there um, on all of our like electric sources, right? They all have these tiny stinky devices. Um and just getting to play with them and see what they do and trying to work with them. Um, our interns work on different things like test beds. So we have a project called Zero Trust, which is um, essentially the concept that you don't trust anything in your network. Um, and they get to play with um, tons of different devices. Those are more based towards like building technologies. Um, but we've done other ones as well that aren't that are more energy focused, I should say. Rita, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, there's many different ways to learn. It's a, it's a, just like how cyber is a real broad area. So is infrastructure. So hardware based, taking apart things, but hardware and software are so intertwined these days. You could just focus on software the whole time and do it. Um, Faith, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your role or your um, path to go from a, uh, the school that you started off with. Now you're, you're trying to get a master's, please. Yeah, so I actually started um, just getting my bachelor's in general computer science. And I wasn't actually sure which sector of computer science I wanted to go into, but I did attend a, a coding sort of boot camp that my uni was sponsoring. And that's actually where I met Shea. And she referred me to uh, INL actually and said, hey, you might want to apply to be an intern here. So I did. And I got introduced basically to uh, working in cybersecurity and computer science closer to the energy sector through that experience. And I enjoyed it so much. And it seems like such an important sector that I just stayed <laughs> and I'm still working here. So that also kind of shows the importance, I would think, of networking or taking opportunities that your school potentially has like an optional coding camp or a temporary internship somewhere or just things that give you these experiences of maybe what work in the actual field looks like and it just gets you to know people that know people that know people so well and with our connected devices not going down they're going up every year our need for energy increases as well. And so it sure seems like it's it. not only do we need more people going into the field to protect our infrastructure, but also just because of the volume that is occurring over and over again every year, it seems like we have more volume of connected devices. So um, it, it, does, it is a really good field if you're at all mechanically or coding inclined or just interested in protecting our and serving in a different way, protecting our critical infrastructure. It's a great, um, it's a great career to have. So any, any final words from Rita, Faith, or Shea? No, just thanks for having us. I know that this is a little bit different than the other ones, but well, you know, I the Idaho National Lab is also a little bit different than others. I mean, it's not it's a it's a government agency. It's not you know not for profit. It's there to support infrastructure, and uh, so I appreciate that showing the differences in our videos is it, and the different careers out there. It's really important. So, thank you all three of you so much for coming on to talk to us today. Anytime. Thanks, Laura. Thank you for having us.